all had those times in life when you're working, you're serving, you're going to school, you're doing all the things you're supposed to do, and then uh, life throws you that curveball. And you wonder, where does it come from? And how do you work through this? The theme we're using is staying faithful, even in the unexpected. And sometimes there are those things that hit you, and you just wonder, where did that come from? I wasn't expecting that. And we look at the life of Joseph, as Monty's already said. And I, I, I think of Joseph, I think of this hero. I think of this man that accomplished so much and did so well. And, but certainly, there's the rest of his story. There were struggles and the difficulties that he faced. And it seems like it just kept hitting him back and forth. And what we're going to do is we're going to start in Genesis chapter 37, and we're going to walk through the end of the book of Genesis. You know, there's more written about the Joseph of the Old Testament than there is about Abraham or Isaac or any of the other great patriarchs of old. Much time is given to his story. And we want to examine that, just walk through it. And I'm, and I'm excited about our, our, all of our midweek studies, our life groups are doing the same thing. And they've been working hard on their, their Bible studies of what does the Bible say about this? And then how do we apply it to our lives? And we had our kickoff last week. They went well. If you haven't joined one, we invite you to come this week. But just what does God's word say to me? And when you study it together in a group, it really does help sink in. But let's look at this, Genesis chapter 37, beginning with verse number two. This is the account of Jacob, who is the father of Joseph. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the son of Bilhah, the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, who are Rachel and Leah, and he brought their father a bad report about them. So you already get the setting. He's only 17 years old, and Jacob has essentially four wives. He's got 12 sons, and this is the mess they live in. In Old Testament, they didn't use this term, but today we would call this a dysfunctional family, all right? We're going to see this. Verse 3, now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Do you hear a problem coming? Because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made him a richly ornamented, ornamented robe for him. So he has favoritism. He points that out so everybody knows who's his favorite. Verse 4, when his brothers saw that the father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So you have this mess, this setting, just those few verses that tells us that this hero Joseph, who did so much later on in his life, started out things were pretty difficult. His father did have, have four women, had children with four women all together. They all lived together. So Joseph had 10 half brothers, one full brother. He had a half sister, and they were in this conglomeration of a family with all kinds of issues and fighting going on. Dad shows him favoritism by making him this ornamented coat. We know it as the coat of many colors. The description of the words, we see it only used another time. It's actually a, crow, a robe of royalty. It's a robe with really long sleeves. It was very long all the way to the ground. Not something you'd wear if you're going to be out working in the fields. So it almost sets him up as he's more special than all the rest of the brothers. And they hated him for it. They were upset with him, but it continued on. This hatred was there. The fighting was there. He had a difficult life. His mom, Rachel, had died when he was a very young man or very young boy. His grandpa Isaac had passed away after that. And so he had some things that hit him in his life that says, this boy did not grow up in an ideal setting where everything was supposed to be wonderful. At the age of 17, as a teenager when the story begins, he had faced a lot already, but it's just getting started. Verse number five, Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, what happened? They hated him all the more. Now this dream seems to be a vision from God. So God has put this vision in him that says, this is something about your future, where you're going. And his brothers hate him for it. This first dream, the next few verses tells us, it was that they were out in the fields gathering their, the grain together. And you think of it as they're cutting down weak stocks. And they're fine. He says, we were binding them all together. And Joseph said, after we bound them all with twine, he said, my sheaf stood up. And all yours came over and bowed down before my sheaf of, of grain. Just think of an animated TV show or an animated movie. That's what's going on. And as a result of that, his brothers hated him. Verse 8, his brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they did what? They hated him all the more. 
because of his dream and what he had said. So this hatred, this anger towards him just seems to keep growing and growing. And then he has another vision, another dream. And this one is even stronger. He said, I had this dream and the sun and the moon and 11 stars were all bowing down to me. And he told his father and his father rebuked him over it. He said, do you think your mom and dad and all your brothers are gonna bow down before you? And the response, verse 11, his brothers were jealous of him and his father kept the matter in mind. And so as a young man, he's, he's getting these visions and if he did anything wrong, maybe he talked about it a little too much, but he's just still just saying, wow, this is what, what I'm experiencing. They hated him, they were angry at him, the opposition now just coming against him and it's just growing and growing and growing. And so you have this, this weird situation going on, dysfunctional family, it's a total mess in so many ways. He's the favorite, he's got a little privilege, but he's hated by all of them against him. The next several verses tells about the rest of the story through the end of this chapter. Chapter, this opposition just keeps growing and growing and as the brothers actually get together and as a plot, they wanna kill him. They just wanna get rid of him. They think their life was gonna be a lot better off without him. Reuben, the oldest brother, comes in and says, oh, let's don't do that. And so he's trying to figure out how can I get Joseph out of this mess and still protect him? But as a whole, the opposition was strong. Now in verse number 24, We see there, or 23, it says, so when Joseph came to his brothers, where they were at in the fields, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty, and there was no water in it. So he comes to see them out in the fields, they're angry, they grab him, they tear this coat off of him, they throw him in this pit. Wednesday night when we were getting the kickoff for our, our, our groups, Roger said, referred to this as, this is truly being in the pits of life. Think about that, no, no, no. That's, that's Roger's humor, not mine. So he's in the pit, literally he's down here, and then to show where they were at, verse 25, it says, and so they sat down to eat their meal. So Joseph is in the pit, No doubt, here's this teenager going, hey, somebody help me. What are you doing? What are you doing with me? Get me out of here. And they're so callous, they just sit down and eat their meal while he's over there screaming. While they're eating, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. So they're sitting there eating their meal, probably delighted in the fact that they're getting rid of Joseph. They're wanting to kill him. And this caravan comes through. Look at verse number 26. Judah, one of the brothers, said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our flesh and blood. And the brothers agreed. So here's this kind mercy of a brother saying, well, we are brothers. I guess we shouldn't kill him. Let's sell him off to be a slave forever. That's the result, and that's the extent of their compassion. So they have this hatred building, the jealousy, they're gonna kill him, and they say, ha, oh, we could just kill him, but we could actually make some money off of this, and that's even better. So the next verses tells us that they sold him for 20 pieces of silver, 20 shekels of silver, which is actually the amount of a slave. So he's sold as a slave, and he's carried off, and what goes all the way down to Egypt. Now they gotta figure out what to tell dad. So they take his coat, they kill a goat, and they dip his coat in the animal blood, and they go home and say, hey, dad, this is a horrible way they did it. So just saying, what happened? They're saying, hey, do you know this coat? And their dad looks at it, of course, they recognize it, it's Joseph's. And they said, oh, some wild animal must have come and killed him, because this is all we found. And of course, their dad is thrown into a horrible place of grieving and loss, and their sons are relieved, they're happy. They've got rid of their problem while they've destroyed the life of their father and certainly their their younger brother. So here's Joseph. He's carried off. He becomes a slave. Now he's at a place where this huge setback in life and you're wondering, how does he stay faithful? Our theme is staying faithful in the unexpected. How does Joseph do that? How does he stand for there? Here he's got this vision. He believes God's got something called for him to do. In the midst of it, he finds himself hated by his brothers, thrown in a pit, and now a slave. He's down in Egypt, and now he's got to learn a new language, a new culture, and survive. How does he do that? How does he walk through that? There is some things in his family heritage that were actually good. His great-grandpa was, was Abraham. 
And God has spoke to Abraham in a strong way, and then no doubt that had been passed on to him. So there's some things that were back there. His grandpa Isaac was there. He knew his grandpa Isaac. He had taught him some things about the faithfulness of God. Jacob actually did have some really good, strong, good moments in his life. At one point, he got his family together, and he says, we need to get ready to meet God. And he took all of his family. If you go back to Genesis chapter 35, we see this in verse 3. Jacob gets his family all together, and he says, then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. And no doubt, Joseph, as a young man, heard his dad do that. This is a special time for his family all to come together and worship God. And he's saying, God is always with me in times of distress. And no doubt, Jacob would have told his life story, which is one of extremes and running for his life and being tricked and betrayed and finally coming home and being forgiven. And so here's his father who's told him this, but that verse, that God has always been with me in the day of my distress. I wonder if Joseph, when he was in that pit or when he's being carried off as a slave or in the years that were going to follow the hardship in Egypt, if he didn't remember that verse, the teaching of his father, that God is with us always in our distress. He had this dream that God said, I'm going to make something of you, but everything was going against him. So we see Joseph staying faithful in the unexpected anyway. Despise, despise all of that. He's just stayed in there. So today, if you come from a broken home, this story's for you. If you've been betrayed, this story is for you. Maybe if you were abused in the past or your friends had lied about you, then this story is for you. If your family doesn't understand you, if someone has broken their promise to you, a friend, a family, a spouse, this story is for you. Maybe life has thrown you a real disastrous curveball or there's, you're facing this huge obstacle in life right now, whatever that may be. Maybe it's health or people or job. This story is for you. If your future seems uncertain, you thought it was this way, but now it's going this way. You don't know what's happening. This story is for you. Here's Joseph. He's one of 12 brothers, this dysfunctional family. He's a mess. There's a hatred. There's despise. He becomes a slave. He went from being the favored son to now he's a nobody. God has said you're somebody, but he is a nobody. He now enters into a life of obscurity. He's just one slave among many. And things like things, it seems like things are turning around for him, he does well, and then he becomes a prisoner, and he's one prisoner among many, and he's forgotten about, he's left there. And here he is this man who God, his, who thought God was really leading him, is now at a place where he's just a nobody. Have you ever felt that way? You ever felt like I'm just one student among many, I'm just one here, and there's all these people around, and I'm just over here by myself, and no one even knows I exist. Or maybe it's in your family you feel that way. Other people seem like they get all of it. They do it all right, and you don't. Or at your work, there's all these people, and I'm just one more person here hoping to collect a paycheck. You go to a large gathering. It's a horrible thing to be in a large group of people, and you feel that loneliness come over because you're just over here by yourself. And you wonder, how do I keep going in the feeling of obscurity? And where's God in this? I wonder if Joseph felt that way. Where are you, God, in this? And as we look over the next several weeks, we're going to see that God was moving and active. In some ways, Joseph knew that God was there anyway. Charlie Brown is always a good place to go for some good theology. He was talking with his friend Linus about problems, and Linus says this, I don't like to face problems head on. I think the best way to solve problems is to avoid them. In fact, this is a distinct philosophy of mine. No problem is so big or complicated that it can't be ran away from. That's kind of nice, but it doesn't work. Because you run away, they just keep following after you. So in that place, the problems are overwhelming. You're feeling obscurity. How to overcome obscurity? First of all, a few things we see in Scripture is remember that God is sovereign. God is sovereign. He is over all. He is there. And a couple of chapters, in chapter 39, we're going to see Joseph use that phrase over and over. In the midst of a painful place, he says, God is with me. God is with me. The Lord is with me. And he knew that no matter what the circumstances that he was facing, that God was still with him. Jeremiah, chapter 32, verse 17. 
It says, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. See, God, you are overall, you're the creator God. You have all the power, and there's nothing that comes that he is not able to handle. That God is sovereign. So no matter what is there, no matter what's going on, you're overwhelmed thinking, what is it? God is still there. Kilmer Myers tells a story. He was a, a pastor in Manhattan back in the middle of the last century. And he said there was this lady who would come every day after she got off work at four o'clock and stand up from his church and just hurl and yell insults to Jesus in anger. And he couldn't figure out what was going on. And finally, he, he talked to Emma and he said, what is your story? She was a survivor of the Holocaust. And she saw all that happened to her was because she was a Jew and it was Christians that were doing it to her. And so she was angry at him. And finally one day he says, why don't you just come inside the church and tell Jesus in the church instead of out here on the street? So she went in and he waited quite a while and time passed and time passed. And it says nearly an hour and she never came out. And he went in and found her and he said she was on the floor in front of the large cross they had in the front and she was weeping. And he says, are you okay? And she said, I realized Jesus was a Jew also and he went through what I went through. There's hard times in life, and you go, how does this all fit together? We look at the life of Jesus, and what Monty read earlier, here's Jesus, the sovereign God, but what did he do? He came, and he faced huge opposition and problems. But obviously, God was still there in the midst of it. Problems are in life, and God understands. God is with us. Another thing, how to overcome obscurity is not only remember that God is sovereign, but believe that you have a purpose. There's a purpose in your life. Joseph remembered the visions. He remembered that God had a plan, that there was a purpose for him, and there is for each of us as well. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Would you read this with me? And we'll notice the we verse. This is for us. Would you read it with me? For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. What is the word for who? So God has created you and designed you. He's given you a purpose. There's good works that you're to accomplish. There's things that you're to do. God has put it in front of you. He notices you. There's a reason for your life. You're not just here by accident. You're not just sitting on the side. God has a purpose for your life, and it's laid out in front of you, and you're to follow it. No matter what the obstacles, no matter what Joseph is going to face, he still had a purpose, and it was there for him. There was a time when the country of Israel, the whole nation, because of the disobedience, were carried off as captives and they became slaves in a foreign country. And while they were there, it was hard, it was difficult. And here's this whole group of people had become slaves, similar as Joseph had become a slave. In the midst of it, God sent a prophet to them and the prophet said this, this verse is taken out of context many times. So in the midst of hardship and slavery and problems, the promise of God says this, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And maybe you're in the midst of one of those desert times of life. You're overwhelmed, the opposition is so high, and you're going, God, where are you? Know that he is sovereign, and know that he has a purpose for your life in the midst of your pain. And by the way, the country, the group of Israelite, the people remained in captivity for another 70 years. And God worked through that and taught them and did some great things. He keeps his promise. So God has a purpose for your life. So how to get out of this state of obscurity is not only recognizing that God is sovereign, that he has a purpose for your life, but also don't let the past dictate your future. Don't let the past dictate your future. We don't see that Joseph blamed his family. We don't see that he fell into this victim mentality of everybody owes him and everything is wrong, or we don't see him even move into the place of bitterness and anger, which if anybody deserved it to be able to do that, it was him. We see him just staying faithful in life, no matter what. Isaiah chapter 43 is a strong verse. It just speaks some good truth to us. Verse number 18, it says, forget the former things and do not dwell on the past. 
See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do, not, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. So you're at that bottom place. You're at the place where all the opposites against, opposition's against you, and you wonder what's going on. And he says, just kind of put some stuff back here and know that I'm there with you and know that you have a purpose and a plan ahead of you. And I'm not sure where you're at or what your story is. Each of us have a past, and some of our pasts are far more painful and difficult than others. Maybe it's something from your childhood. Maybe it's something from your adulthood, the thing that came in and hit you hard, the opposition there, and it's just overwhelming to you. And we look at the story of Joseph, it is not minimizing pain. It's real. It's life-altering. It's changing. It affects you greatly. But because of the power of grace in Jesus, there is a future, and there is a hope that we can endure, and he's preparing to work in you for something greater ahead of you. Later in this series, we're going to be taking a look at how do you actually face those past issues? How do you face those head on? And then how do you move forward with them? And we're not uh, trying to teach that, oh, you just forgive and forget and move on. Everything's okay because life is far more complicated than that. But there is a place of forgiveness. And there definitely is a place of moving on. Your future is God's future. And God has a plan in your life. And he makes all things new. The scars in your life... They don't have to define you. They shape you. But you have the power of God and his grace in your life to help you move forward. Amen? And there's where we come together to do that. You can't do that by yourself. And sometimes we need to go to the person and say, that you just trust, say, would you just pray over me and pray with me continually? We go to people who give you wise counsel and guidance because sometimes our friends just... They just kind of agree with you or tell you to get over it. And sometimes you need that professional to come and help guide you walk through those pains of your past. And certainly you need those ongoing relationships. And that's where we push you and encourage you and invite you to join one of the groups. Monday night groups are good for facing issues and moving forward. The Wednesday groups, the home groups, the Thursday morning, the Thursday night groups are all times you come in you look at God's word and you apply it to your life. And you wrestle through these things. But we're going to decide, we're going to walk with God. How do you face that opposition? The place of obscurity, one other is just decide to live faithfully. Decide I'm going to live faithful. Joseph stayed faithful no matter what came, no matter what the unexpected was that hit him. And over the next several weeks, if you just finish reading this, the book of Genesis from 37 on, you're going to see, man, thing after thing after thing just kept going against him. But decide I'm going to remain faithful no matter what. Viktor Frankl was um, one of those people that endured the Nazi prison camps. He was humiliated, he was tortured, he was dehumanized, and he said this, the last of all great human freedom is to choose one's response to any given set of circumstances. So the things that come up against you, the things that are overwhelming against you, you still have the decision to make How are you going to respond to it? When the evil one overwhelms you and knocks you down, there's the natural response that comes. And he's so thrilled when you come out bitter and angry and resentful. But there's a different way of doing it. Addressing those issues, addressing the circumstances, and realizing that what Satan has done against you, God can turn it around and work in it somehow. And many times we take those things from our past and we use them as an excuse for sin or an excuse for our behavior going forward. And it's hard to move forward with it. Many of things have happened to us in the past. Many bad things have happened. And it leaves you feeling really obscure. It leaves you as feeling unimportant. It leaves you as feeling used and pushed off to the side. Like it really doesn't matter in life. And you look at people around and they seem to be flying high and going strong. And you think, how can I do that? And some of you have been to the place where you're flying high and one thing hits you. And you're knocked so far down, you wonder how I can get back up. You feel unnoticed and unimportant and scarred. Maybe it's a dysfunctional family. Maybe there's abuse. Maybe it was an alcoholic, a parent of some sort that worked hard things against you. Maybe it's the spouse who promised and then they broke their promise in a huge way. 
Maybe you're betrayed by a friend or your, or your career tanked because of some dishonesty against you, someone lying against you, and you're wondering at the bottom of this, how do I turn around? And we all say, pain is real, and it's hard, and it's difficult. But we look at Joseph and say, how did he endure this? It's because he believed God was sovereign, and he believed that God was present, believed God had a power in his life that was there by the Holy Spirit coming in. He's in each one of us who follow him as our savior. And he's got a purpose for you that you can put the past behind and move on in a healthy way, but in a greater way, in a stronger way because of the scars in your life. And realize that you have a future. And that you can be faithful through all these difficult times and move into that place. Joseph didn't let the past make him a victim, but he chose to live faithfully no matter what came. Jabez is, a, is a man, another man in the Old Testament. And Jabez is one of these that, that people like to take this little verse and you pull it out of, out of context again. But Jabez, if we look at his life, it was difficult. His name is, is strong. We read in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9, it says, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. And they just look at that and go, oh, okay. But his name... Jabez means pain. So I don't know if was, she's talking about the physical pain of birth or the emotional pain surrounding his birth, but she basically cursed him with his life. Because in, in that time period, your name meant a lot. It described you as a person, it described your future. And so here's this young boy growing up who's named pain. You're a pain in life. Your future is a pain. He's got this overwhelming sense about him and he understands a little bit where Joseph's coming through. It's like, my childhood is a mess. Can you imagine his peers, his friends, and what they were calling him, and the people around him, what they thought of his life? And here's this guy growing up, says he's more honorable than his brothers, but he didn't let his name, the setback, the hatred, or the, the bitterness of his mom turn him against God, but he honored God. In verse 10, it says, Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from, what? Pain. And God granted him his request. So here's this guy who's been knocked down, kind of like Joseph, and he goes before God. He believes in prayer, believes that God's all-powerful. He says, God, would you work in my life? And would you bless me? And when my mom and every people said, you're just a pain, would you free me from pain? And God, would you give me a future? And his answer to Jabez was, yes. God answered his prayer. Joseph, I have no doubt, was praying when he was in that pit. I have no doubt he was praying as he was going down to Egypt. I have no doubt he was praying over the years that followed and we're going to take a look at so many different things. How is it going to be that we wait upon God? And in the midst of these times, we're saying, God, where are you? But know that God's presence is there. But his answer is going to be yes. As we endure and we walk through it. Joseph, he stayed faithful in the unexpected. Wherever you're at, whatever's going on in your life right now, I encourage you, stay faithful and trust God. And let's just look to him and say, God, would you show me and give me some direction in life? Father, I'm grateful for the story of Joseph. I'm grateful that he was able to stay faithful even through great hardship and difficulty. And Father, I wanna pray for the person in this room today who is facing just a huge mountain in front of them and uncertainty about the future. And Father, even though we pray that the mountains be removed and they're not removed immediately, help us to trust you in the midst of it. Father, I pray that even through pain and difficulty, that our faith in you will grow. And Father, I do believe sometimes at our most difficult times of life, we understand you more and more. And I pray that that would be true for each person here today. I pray for the person who is just wondering and questioning whether, which way we should go in life. And God, if you're real, Father, I pray that you would meet them in the midst of their questions, in the midst of their pain. And Father, whatever comes, unexpected, 
Help us to be faithful and to walk with you. Father, help us to reach out today and encourage and lift someone up in their battle and their difficulties. Father, would you receive our praises and would you hear our prayer? It's in Jesus I pray.